In this video, we're going to just take a look at the review sheet that was done in class, um, Electrochemistry Concepts Number 1, just uh, intended to be a review of some um, introductory ideas in the new unit. The first question was asking you to define oxidation and include at least two parts in the definition. Um, we gave four different ways of defining oxidation and reduction, but the two most important ways, oxidation is the loss of electrons. That's the best way to define it, the loss of electrons. If an atom is losing electrons or a species is losing electrons, then its oxidation state increases. And that's the other part of the definition. It says include two parts. Um, rem and remember that an oxidation state, as we're about to see, is similar to charge. It's like an imaginary charge that's used to keep track of electrons. Um, if an atom loses electrons, then it's losing negatives, and so its charge or its oxidation state will go up. Question two, um, assign oxidation states to each atom in the species below. So the first example, S2O3, with a charge of 2 minus, we know that we have a rule for assigning oxidation states that says oxygen in a compound is almost always minus 2. So the oxygen there, I'll give an oxidation state of minus 2. There's three of them, three oxygens, so 3 times minus 2 is minus 6. The entire thing has a charge of minus 2. There's a minus 2 charge right there. So if I've got minus 6 from the oxygens and the whole thing is minus 2, then there has to be positive 4 to balance that off. And that positive 4 is divided between two sulfur atoms, so each sulfur is positive 2. Just to double check, 2 times positive 2 is 4, 3 times negative 2 is negative 6, and 4 plus negative 6 would give me negative 2, the charge on the species. So I know I've done that right. So there's sulfur and there's oxygen. The second part of the question, part B, says S8. And I recognize that that's just the element sulfur. It's a form of the elemental sulfur. And so by definition, its oxidation state would be zero. Each atom there has a zero oxidation state. The third example, silver nitrate. I recognize it as an ionic compound, a metal bonded to, in this case, complex ion, nitrate. So before I do anything, I'm going to split it into its two ions, Ag and NO3. And I remember my earlier chemistry that nitrate is NO3 minus, and that means the one silver bonded to it is Ag positive. Now that I've split it into ions, I'll consider each one separately. So Ag positive is an atom with just one with a charge beside it. It's a monoatomic ion, and so its oxidation state is the same as its charge, in this case, plus one. In the nitrate ion, we have oxygens, and we know that they are minus twos. There's three of them, so for a total of minus six. Three times minus two is minus six. That one nitrogen, in order to give a charge of minus one on the nitrate ion, would have to have a state of, ox of uh, oxidation state of plus five. And so just to double check that, we have one silver, that's plus one. We have one nitrogen, that's plus five, for a total of plus six. And we have three oxygens, three times minus two is minus six. And in silver nitrate, the charges do cancel out, so that does make sense. In the last example here, HASO4, 2 minus. So again, we have plus 1s for hydrogens. Remember, that's one of the basic things when you see hydrogen in a compound. Plus 1 is almost always its oxidation state. Similarly, oxygen in a compound is almost always minus 2. So now let's figure out the arsenic atom in the middle. The entire thing has a charge of minus 2, so we have to add up to that total. We have four oxygens. Four times minus two is minus eight. So there'd have to be positive six to give me this total charge of minus two. The positive six, we've already got positive one for hydrogen, so the arsenic must be positive five. All right, part three. Identify in this balanced equation what's being oxidized, what's being reduced, and then the oxidizing and reducing agents. 
we remember that the substance being reduced will be gaining electrons, and so its oxidation state will go down. The substance being oxidized will be losing electrons, and so its oxidation state will go up. So when we look at the equation here, let's try to think in terms of oxidation states. Hydrogen here is plus one, and on the product side, hydrogen in water is also plus one. We have rules for, let's say, hydrogen when it's part of a compound, like in water, is always plus one, or almost always. So the hydrogen is not changing, so hydrogen is not going to be reduced or oxidized. The oxygens, similarly, are minus two in the dichromate ion, they're minus two in the nitrite ion, they're minus two in the nitrate ion, and they're minus two in the water, so the oxygens are also not changing. So that leaves chromiums and nitrogens. And sure enough, if we look closely here, we have seven oxygens. That's seven times negative two is negative 14. The whole ion is, has, has a charge of two minus. So if we've got negative 14 of oxygens, there'd have to be positive 12 from the chromiums. And that 12 is divided between two chromiums. So each one started at positive six. Over here on the product side, the chromiums are positive three. So to go from six to three means you've dropped in oxidation state, you've gained electrons. So we would say now that the dichromate is the substance being reduced. Now as soon as I've decided that it's being reduced, because there's a plus six down to plus three in the chromium in dichromate, then automatically I can go down here and say that the substance being reduced, we know another name for it, is that it's the oxidizing agent. Those are actually the same things. The substance that gets reduced is causing something else in the reaction to get oxidized. Therefore, it's also called the oxidizing agent. Similarly, if we can figure out the thing that's being oxidized, it is causing something else in the reaction to be reduced. Therefore, it will be the reducing agent. Now, the thing being oxidized is really only one species left. That's here in the nitrite, but let's verify it. We have two oxygens. That's two times minus two is minus four. The entire thing has a charge of minus one. So if we've got minus four, then the nitrogen starts off at plus three. Over on the right, we've got nitrate with three oxygens. Three times minus two is minus six. The entire ion has a charge of minus one, so the nitrogen here must be plus five. And so to go from three up to five means that you're losing electrons. So the nitrite ion, or specifically the nitrogen in nitrite, but we'll just say the nitrite ion, NO2 minus, is the substance that's losing electrons. It's increasing oxidation state, so it's being oxidized. Therefore, the nitrite is also your reducing agent. Question number four uses the balanced equation that we see in the previous question to do a titration problem. We're told that we have 25 milliliters of the 0.025 molarity potassium nitrite, and there's nitrite ion that we saw in the previous reaction. And it's titrated um, with a solution of potassium dichromate. And here's the dichromate ion that we saw in the previous reaction. We're told that the potassium dichromate was 17.45 milliliters to reach the equivalence point. What was the concentration of the potassium dichromate solution? I'll set this up with a string of unit multipliers. Because this volume, 25 milliliters, is paired with this concentration, I'm going to start with those two numbers. I never start with the unit multiplier, so I'm not going to start with the concentration, because you remember that molarity means moles per liter, so this is actually a unit multiplier. So I'm going to start with my 25 milliliters, 25.0 milliliters, of the potassium nitrate, KNO2. And what I'll do first is switch my milliliters to liters. And then I'll get rid of the liters and switch to moles of potassium nitrite. That's using the concentration of potassium nitrite, which was given in the question. Now I'm going to be a little bit lazy with my multipliers. I'm going to do some mental math and notice that in the formula KNO2, 
there's one um, NO2. Actually, you know what? Let me just, I'm not going to do this method. I'll just do it explicitly. I will get rid of the moles of KNO2, and I'll switch to moles of NO2 minus, because that's in the balanced equation up above NO2 minus. And now that I'm talking about the balanced equation, I'll switch from moles of NO2 minus to moles of potassium dichromate, K2Cr2O7. And then, <laughs> we'll, now that we've got moles of di potassium dichromate, actually that should have just been dichromate, now I'll switch from moles of dichromate to moles of potassium dichromate. And then two more multipliers. I've got moles of potassium dichromate. I'm going to want concentration. So to switch from moles to concentration, you divide by volume. You remember your little formula, C equals N over V. So divide the moles by volume. The volume here was in milliliters, so I'm going to go ahead and divide by that. But then to get a molarity, you have to convert the milliliters to liters. So I'm going to put the milliliters here on top and liters on the bottom just to cancel those out. So let's see how this works. The milliliters cancel at the beginning. Liters cancel. Moles of KNO2 and moles of KNO2 cancel. Moles of nitrite and moles of nitrite cancel. Moles of dichromate doesn't, or sorry, moles of dichromate cancels and becomes moles of potassium dichromate. And then milliliters cancel. And what I'm left with is moles of potassium dichromate per liter, which of course means we found the molarity of the potassium dichromate. So now let's put numbers in and get an answer. One liter has a thousand milliliters. The concentration of KNO2 was 0 0.025 moles per liter. From the, balance, from the formula of KNO2, we can see that there's one mole of NO2 in one mole of KNO2. From the balanced equation up above, we can see that one mole of dichromate reacts with three moles of nitrite. So three moles of nitrite for one mole of dichromate. In the formula of potassium dichromate, we can see that there's one mole of dichromate in one mole of potassium dichromate. And the volume of the potassium dichromate was 17.45 milliliters, and there's 1,000 milliliters in a liter. So there we've got it. Now we'll just grab a calculator and evaluate this. 25 divided by 1,000, I'm switching to liters, multiplying by 0 0.025, I've just found the moles of potassium nitrite. And now I'll divide that by 3, and I've just found the moles of dichromate, divide by the volume 17.45, and multiply by 1,000 again at the end, and we get a concentration of 0 0.0119 molarity potassium dichromate. So you can see that although this was a redox question, at its heart it's still a titration problem. And so we did basically um, dealing with concentrations and volumes of one substance, then the balanced equation in the middle relating one substance to another substance, and then concentrations and volumes again at the end. Question number five asks you to balance an equation in acid solution. So let's quickly go through the steps. If you've, You should have these steps written down in your notes or you've watched in a previous video. The first step is to split the original equation into two half reactions. So H2O2, the first reactant, I'll leave space because I'll be adding things, becomes O2, the first product there. Um, the H2O2 and the O2 go together. The dichromate and the chromium go together. So dichromate becomes chromium-3. Okay. Now that's not just because they're in that order. It's because you know, the dichromate has chromium and chromium-3 has chromium, so they get paired together. Okay. Now, after splitting, we go through a series of steps. First, we look for anything other than hydrogen and oxygen, and we balance that. The first equation has nothing other than hydrogen and oxygen, so leave it. 
The second equation needs a 2 in front of the chromium to balance the chromiums. Now we'll balance oxygens, and this is a little unusual compared to grade 10 or 11 chemistry because we're going to balance oxygens here by adding something. We're going to add water. The reaction was happening in a solution, which means there's water present, and the original equation was not a complete equation. It was a skeleton reaction, so it was leaving, it left out things like water. So we can balance oxygens with H2O. The first equation is already balanced with oxygens. The second one has seven oxygens on the left and none on the right. So to fix that, I'll put seven water molecules on the right. And now hydrogens, because the reaction was in an acid solution, we know that acids produce hydrogen ions. So we can fix the hydrogens, we can balance them using hydrogen ions, H+. In the second equation, we have 7 times 2, 14 hydrogens on the right, so I'll add 14 hydrogen ions to the left. Now I've got everything balanced in terms of atoms. Let's balance the charges. On the left-hand side of the first reaction, we just see the hydrogen peroxide, and it's neutral. It has no charge. So right now, zero is the charge there. On the right, we see oxygen, which is neutral, but then we have these two hydrogen ions, two positives. So this side is positive two. So to balance those charges, to make the charges the same on both sides, we're going to add electrons, and electrons are negative, so we always add them to the side that's more positive. Zero versus positive two, the right-hand side needs some negatives, and because the difference here is two, we'll add two electrons to the right-hand side. In the second equation, we have a dichromate, 2 minus, and we have 14 positives. So 2 minus and 14 positives gives me positive 12. And on the right, we have two chromium 3s, which is positive 6. And then the waters are neutral, so positive 6. The left-hand side now is more positive, the positive 12. The difference between them is 6. So I'm going to add 6 electrons to the left-hand side. Now, as soon as I added electrons to the product side in the first reaction, I can now say it was an oxidation reaction. You're producing, you're losing electrons. And since the electrons in the, left, in the second reaction are on the left, it's a reduction reaction. Electrons being gained on the left is a reduction process. Now, this first equation has just two electrons, while the second one has six. We have to make the electrons equal. To do that, 2 and 6, the lowest common multiple is 6. So I'll multiply the first equation by 3 to give me 6 electrons. And now I'll recombine my equations. I'll write the reactants and products first in the order that they were originally given in the reaction. So we had three H2O2s, reacts with one dichromate, now I'm going to leave some space because we have to deal with water and hydrogen ions. And that gives me 3 times 1. Don't forget to multiply by that 3 out front. So 3 O2s. And then we have 2 chromium 3 pluses. Now what about hydrogen ions? In the first equation, 3 times 2, there are 6 hydrogens on the right. In the second equation, there's 14 hydrogens on the left. So we've got 14 hydrogens on the left, and we have six hydrogens on the right. We have to um, have hydrogens only on one side, not on both. So what I'll do is I'll subtract the smaller number from both sides. That'll bring this to zero, and this will go from 14 minus six down to eight hydrogen ions on the left. So eight hydrogen ions are left there. And then we have these seven waters as products also. So there's the balanced equation in acid solution. The next question is, a, again, a titration problem, and it's going to need this ratio that we have here, three moles of peroxide for one mole of dichromate. Um, the question says, three grams of impure potassium dichromate was titrated using hydrogen peroxide in acid solution. So it's the same reaction we just saw. Um, the titration required 27.38 milliliters of the 0.02 molar hydrogen peroxide. 
what was the mass percent of potassium dichromate in the impure sample. So this three grams is not the mass of potassium dichromate, it's the mass of a sample that contains potassium dichromate. So let's use the titration information to find the mass of potassium dichromate that's in that three gram sample. So we did this a couple questions ago. We'll start with the volume, 27.38 milliliters of the hydrogen peroxide. And I'm going to switch from milliliters to liters. And then using the concentration from liters to moles of hydrogen peroxide. And now I'll switch from looking at the balanced equation above, we can switch from peroxide to dichromate. So moles of hydrogen peroxide to moles of dichromate. And then we need potassium dichromate, so I'll switch from moles of dichromate to moles of potassium dichromate. And then finally, we wanted grams, so I'll add one more multiplier. We'll get rid of moles and switch to grams of potassium dichromate. So on the far left, one liter has a thousand milliliters. The concentration of your hydrogen peroxide was 0 0.020 moles per liter. The balanced equation tells us that a mole of dichromate will react with three moles of hydrogen peroxide. That was from the equation above. In the formula of potassium dichromate, one mole of potassium dichromate has one mole of dichromate. And then the molar mass of potassium dichromate, 2 times 39.1, the potassiums, plus 2 times 52, the chromiums, plus 7 times 16, the oxygens, one mole is 294.2 grams. So now putting all that together, we will grab a calculator and evaluate it all. So 27.38 divided by 1,000 and times 0.02, this is the moles of hydrogen peroxide. Divide that by 3 to get the moles of the uh, dichromate, and then multiplied by 294.2, the molar mass of potassium dichromate, and we get 0 0.0537 grams of potassium dichromate are in the sample. Now the sample weighed 3 grams, so we can calculate the percentage of potassium dichromate in the sample by taking the mass of the potassium dichromate, dividing by the mass of the sample, and multiplying by 100 to get percent, which gives me 1.79% potassium dichromate. All right, the last question was a review of balancing in basic solution. We remember that when balancing in basic solution, the problem is we have to deal with hydroxide ions, not hydrogen ions. Um, so we will first, though, our strategy will first to be to balance it in an acid solution, like we did back in question five. Then we'll fix that problem with hydrogen ions and needing hydroxide ions instead. So the first thing, we'll split it into two half reactions. IO3 minus, leave some space, becomes IO minus and the Re becomes ReO4 minus. Now balance everything except H's and O's, and everything here is now balanced other than H's and O's. The one I and one Re. Balance the O's by putting in water molecules. So two water molecules in the first equation on the right will give me three O's on both sides and four water molecules on the left in the second equation will give me four O's on both sides. Now fix your hydrogens using H+. We're balancing it as though it's in an acid solution. Two times two is four, so we need four hydrogen ions on the left of the first equation. Four times two is eight, so we need eight hydrogen ions on the right in the second equation. The charges on the right of the first is minus one. There's only that minus here. 
On the left is minus 1 plus 4, 4 positives. So on the left, it's plus 3. So to get plus 3 down to minus 1, we'll add 4 electrons on the left-hand side, 4 negatives. Always add the electrons to the more positive side. In the second equation, the left-hand side is neutral, it's 0, there's nothing there with a charge. While on the right-hand side, we have eight positives and one negative, so that's plus seven. So the right-hand side is more positive, seven on the right and zero on the left. The difference is seven, so we'll add seven electrons. To make the electrons equal before we recombine, we notice there's four and there's seven, and so the lowest common multiple is 28. We're gonna need to multiply that by seven and that by four, to make the electrons the same in both equations. And now we'll recombine, and I always put it in the order that the original reaction was given. So we have seven iodates. We have four Re's, rhenium, I believe. And then I'll leave some space to deal with the waters and the hydrogen ions. We have four ReO4 minus we have 7IO minus. And now let's talk about hydrogen ions. On the first equation, 7 times 4, we have 28 hydrogens on the left. On the second equation, 4 times 8, we have 32 on the right. So again, 28 on the left and 32 on the right. The difference is 4, and since there's a bigger number on the right, the dip, we'll put that difference, four hydrogens, on the right. So we subtracted the smaller number from both sides, so 28 from both sides, and that left four hydrogens on the right. Do the same thing with waters. We have seven times two, 14 waters on the right-hand side of the first equation, and four times four, 16 on the left-hand side of the second equation. So 16 on the left and 14 on the right. The difference is two. And since there were more on the left, those two will end up on the left after we cancel. So we now have a balanced redox reaction, but the problem is this is an acid solution. To fix it and make it a basic solution, we're going to look at these hydrogen ions. We've got four of them, and we're going to neutralize them using four hydroxides, so an equal amount of hydroxide. To keep the equation balanced, I'll have to add those same four hydroxides to the left-hand side of my equation. Now, when you combine four hydrogens with four hydroxides, they will create four water molecules. So now, let's balance the, the entire equation with basic solution. So we have our seven IO3 minuses. We have our four Re's. We have our four ReO4 minuses and our seven IO minuses. Now, hydroxides, we've got these four on the left, so plus four hydroxides. Waters, we used to have two on the left, but now we've got these four on the right. So two on the left and four on the right, the difference between them is two, and we're going to put that difference on the right because that's where there was more water. So we're doing the same thing we did a little bit uh, earlier. So there's the balanced equation, and because it has hydroxides instead of hydrogen ions, this is now balanced in basic solution. So that was a review of the first couple of days, the first day and a half of the electrochemistry unit with a little bit of new material, not that new, but we applied the balancing um, steps to uh, titration problems in questions four and six on this worksheet.